We will start now uh, with Professor Jane Hunter um, from the University of Queensland. Um, Jane is a research fellow and lead of the E Research Lab at the University of Queensland and also um, works in the School of ITEE. Um, in all of my time of working in this space, um, I think whenever a metadata question comes up, that's when I normally hear Jane's name as part of the solution. Um, and um, Jane is here with a slight change to the program. So the title that you've got in the printed program you've been given out today um, is, is different and it is now the future of big data, data curation, harnessing institutional community and computational power. Um, and so Jane will be um, presenting three case studies um, around um, this issue. Thank you, Jane. Um, I apologise for the change of title. I think the official title was Harmonising Institutional, National and Global um, Repositories. Yeah, I think it's that. Yeah. Um, because they asked me for a title about three months ago and I was on holidays. I think I've been drinking. And then when I came there to do my book, I thought, oh, that's too hard. <laughs> and so then I changed the title to something that I'd be more about. <laughs> Um, so I've jumped on the big data bandwagon as well. Um, I did put the big in brackets. So I'm going to give you three examples of work that we're doing in this field. They're not necessarily big, but I guess the issues also apply to big data. So I'm going to talk about why you need a combined effort for data curation in the future. <coughs> the big data examples. You need to be able to combine traditional metadata techniques with community generated metadata knowledge, with computationally derived metadata using machine learning and semantic reasoning techniques. I'm going to give you three case studies and I'm trying to choose a variety that cover um, the, um, the variety associated with big data, sensor data streams, textual data, and 3D data in three different domains. I'm going to conclude with what are the commonalities and issues and then the future research challenges. So this is a slide which I've stolen from datasciencecentral.com, but it highlights the challenges and issues that you face as data curators wanting to curate big data. There's the volume of the data, terabytes, exabytes, or what is zettabytes, we've heard that one. The velocity of the data. So we're looking at data streams, multiple, multimodal data streams where you need to be able to curate in real time or near real time. The variety of the data, I'll give you some examples of that. Structured, unstructured, text, multimedia, 3D. And then, I think this is most significant, the veracity of the data. So often there's uncertainty, inconsistency, incompleteness, ambiguities in the data. How do you manage that? So, what are our goals? We want High quality data, high quality metadata. We want accurate, fine grain semantic metadata and detailed provenance. Double core isn't going to scale. Too flat, too coarse. Big data indexing, there's too much data there to be able to um, generate fine grain metadata. The data hasn't undergone quality control, and there's often, I've already said, veracity issues. There's no semantics for the metadata. You need to be able to have semantic metadata in order to integrate and answer complex queries. Machine learning enables fast feature extraction, but you require a training corpus to supervise machine learning, which is the approach that we need, that we're using. <coughs> semantic inferencing or rules-based approaches work but only in those domains where you can define rules to infer high-level classification. So our approach is to actually combine community-driven knowledge curation with semantic inferencing and machine learning and institutional metadata. The community are the ones who can um, carry out quality control, they can carry out annotation and tagging, 
and they can define patterns and rules that they're aware of. So our research has been focusing on, for a given domain, what's the optimum combination of institutional metadata, community metadata, and machine-generated metadata. So I'm going to talk about three case studies. The first one is in eco-informatics, so semantic annotation and activity recognition. The second one is bioinformatics, the Skeletone project. And the third one is 3D semantic annotation for cultural heritage. Okay, so the first one. <coughs> so, ecologists are increasingly using animal attached accelerometers to monitor the movement and behavior of animals in the wild. This generates very large volumes of triaxial data streams. And you can see an example in the bottom left over there. So the X, Y, and Z streams showing position. People using accelerometers lack visualization tools, analysis tools, the ability to share these data sets, to identify patterns and to tag them. They're often working with animals in the wild. And so there's no ground truth data. If they're working with animals, domestic animals, or animals in zoos, they can capture videos and can use that for ground truth. Data. So how can we provide analysis, visualization, and tagging tools, automatic tagging tools, for these kinds of data streams? So they want to be able to upload their data sets, describe them, describe the project, describe the animal, describe the background what they're trying to show or their hypothesis. Then they want to automate the activity recognition, and then they want to be able to visualize, for example, how many hours a day does the animal spend sleeping, running, walking. But also they want to be able to visualize, combine accelerometry data with GPS data to visualize how the animal moves over time and what it's doing. So for example, we're looking here at dingoes on Fraser Island. Okay? So they're both a um, uh, endangered, well they're not endangered, they're a protected species but they're also a pest. So <laughs> you need to be able to manage, I know, it sounds a lot in Australia. Don't talk to me about scrub turkeys. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so if once biologists can understand the behaviour and energy consumption of these animals, then they can work out the health and how to manage them and where they go and what they do and how to manage them better. Okay, so our objective was to develop a web-based semantic annotation and activity recognition system to enable biologists to share accelerometry data, visualize and analyze it, share their expert knowledge, help them understand the movement and behavior of the animals, um, and then use surrogates. So we use domestic animals where we have the video to train classifiers, and then we apply those um, classifiers to do automatic tagging of rare endangered species in the wild where there's no ground truth. So this is the architecture of the system at a high level. So this is what an accelerometer looks like. Um, we're collecting our data, our training data involves humans, badgers, domestic dogs, and crocodiles, which seems like an odd one. But we're working with Australia Zoom and um, the Eco Lab at UQ. Um, they collect the accelerometry data and associated video. They can then upload that and then using our interface here and the tagging system, they use the video as ground truth and they can go through and manually tag the training courses. Then we're using LibSBM to then extract out features and build classifiers for particular animals based on the training course. And someone else comes along and uploads data and we automatically put it through the activity recognition and we automatically tag it. So this is what the user interface looks like. Um, here's the video window. You can scroll up and down here. You can choose particular segments and you can tag them using the ontology and it's all captured. Um, and then after you run the activity recognition system, it then generates these kinds of statistical visualizations for you which show the percentage of time the animal has spent on different activities. 
So we've tested this on a range of species, from dingoes, tigers, cheetahs, alligators, wombats, kangaroos, echidnas. These are the types of tags we're looking for. And what we've been doing is using our domestic dog classifier and testing it on different species. And what we found is quite interesting is that you know, we can use our dog classifier and it will work very well on dingo data captured in the wild. It doesn't work so well on kangaroos, and you might expect that because they move very differently. But we also found that there's this inverse relationship based on um, spine length to spine height. So if an animal has a similar spine length and spine height, you can use the domestic classifier and apply it to a wild animal. So what are the benefits of this kind of system? Subscribers can log on to the online service, they can upload their data, they can leverage community expertise that's been used to tag the training data. Communities can develop libraries of classifiers for different species. You can apply the domestic classifiers to wild species, for example, dog classifier to dingoes, and foxes, a bird classifier to bats horses to camels. They improve over time as more data gets uploaded and there's significant socio-economic and health benefits. Associated with livestock productivity, reducing the spread of feral pests and management and conservation. So where's this work going now? So more recently we've been looking at how we can actually combine GPS data with accelerometry data to understand where the animal is and what it's doing. And then we overlay that onto other data. So here, we've overlaid camel tracks onto the vegetation data. And we're able to show that, or prove the hypothesis, that the camels spend a certain amount of time, it might be you know, a week or a couple of weeks, in particular areas where the vegetation that they eat, they only eat particular types of vegetation, where that exists. Then they make a beeline, and you can see that here, so they'll spend a lot of time here, then they make a beeline to another area, and they spend until they eat all that vegetation, and then they go to the next place and eat all of that. So the scientists have been using this to prove their hypotheses about how animals move and how they behave. Um, once we were working on this, I thought, oh, I need one of these for my teenage son. <laughs> <laughs> and he can actually do it. So everyone's just going to track in their husband. I think <laughs> it's just a particular type of smartphones have both like, accelerometers and GPS on them. But then I thought, I don't really want to know where it is and what it's doing. <laughs> okay, I gave up on that idea. Okay, so the next one I'm going to tell you about is a project called Skeleto. And again, we're working closely with the community who have a problem. And it's a community-driven knowledge curation platforms for skeletal dysplasias or skeletal disorders. So they're rare diseases. They affect the human skeleton. They're caused by genetic abnormalities. And they're accompanied with a set of complex medical issues. Because they're quite rare, there's not a lot of information out there. So the specialists and doctors want to be able to capture, integrate, correlate, analyze clinical data, radiographic data, phenotypic data, and genetic data. Um, so you may not have heard of these skeletal dysplasias, but you would know these people. So these are just some examples of people who suffer from skeletal dysplasias. Vern Troy, Mini Me, from the Austin Power movies, um, Peter Dicklich from Game of Thrones, and Danny DeVito. So you can see here, these are the different types of disorders they um, suffer from, and these are the associated genes involved. So there's actually 440 types of skeletal dysplasias. They're grouped into 40 groups. They're very difficult to diagnose and treat. There are very few medical publications. Doctors have to rely on patient data and expert knowledge. They, the community needs common terminology, data integration, quality control, knowledge extraction, knowledge sharing, privacy of the patient cases, and expertise sharing. And this is common across many of the projects we work on. So the system itself consists of two parts. Firstly, there's this patient archive. So the doctors upload 
patient use cases, patient cases. We then, uh, there's an online discussion forum. We analyze those patient cases, the descriptions of them and the discussions. Um, and we use the bone dysplasia ontology as the underlying, um, let's see, the underlying data model for data integration and the data analysis. Um, the bone dysplasia ontology contains 1,200 concepts that describe the disorders, the genes, and um, the symptoms or phenotypes associated with them. And based on the information we extract out of this, as well as expertise input, we build up a knowledge base, which is used both by doctors to help with diagnosis, diagnosis and treatment, but also with training and e-learning. So the bone dysplasia ontology is based on the ISDS nosology, which is a controlled vocabulary of skeletal dysplasias and the groups they're associated with. The ISDS is the International Skeletal Dysplasia Society. Um, what else can I tell you about that? It underpins the skeletal knowledge base. And the knowledge base is a web portal to both the patient archive and the knowledge base. So registered doctors upload patient cases. The experts then assist with the diagnosis. We then perform automatic processing and the experts apply editorial processes, we increment, incrementally develop a knowledge base, um, and if you want to have a look at it, it's at knowledge.skeletone.org. So I'm going to just show you briefly the patient archive and then the knowledge base itself and some of the features that exist. So here we've got a particular doctor, William Shatner, um, who uploads an anonymized patient case. Um, and he's sharing this with other doctors who are part of the ISDS. He describes, has a clinical summary, has x-rays, genetic reports, um, and publications. So here you can see, um, <laughs> so Leonard Nimroy and George Takai are discussing. They can do inline commenting on this particular case. <laughs> they can post related PubMed publications. Um, and then they can discuss diagnoses. So 10 people agree with Leonard, is it Leonard? They say complexity, we disagree. Um, and then we actually run entity recognition software over to extract out diagnoses and phenotypes. And then we help with identifying a particular diagnosis. So we apply reasoning across the patient cases and the publications to extract out relationships between particular skeletal displays, phenotypes and genotypes. We're particularly interested in the certainty, temporality, severity and polarity of those relationships. We add that data to the bone display ontology and then when new use cases come along, we generate ranked lists of possible diagnoses. Um, and the knowledge base itself, for each disease, there are written abstracts, there's the genes associated with that disorder, what groups the diseases belong to, x-rays, phenotypes, and then information such as for a given phenotype, and this is cleft palate, um, what the likelihood is that that occurs with this particular disease. The same technique we're going to be applying, we're working with the Australian College of Rural Remote Medicine um, to apply the same techniques to a corpus of teledermatology use cases. So we're going to analyse those patient cases and the discussions to generate a knowledge base to help with differential diagnoses of dermatology cases that are uploaded from, by GPs in remote areas. Okay, so I'll just quickly cover the last one, which is the 3D cultural heritage um, application. In this one, we're using crowdsourced semantic <coughs> annotations combined with automatically extracted information about dimensions, shape, and color to help to automatically authenticate and catalog artifacts. So we're working with Greek vases from the UQ Antiquities Museum. We've developed a 3D essay tool which allows you to 
just it's a web browser based tool and you can semantically annotate either points, surface regions or 3D volumetric fragments of 3D um, artifacts. It's based on the open annotation data model and we've extended that with X3D fragment identifiers. Um, and then we've got sets of rules and the Greek vast domain is a um, very, it's one of those domains in which you can apply semantic inferencing and rules-based reasoning. So for example, a neck amphora is characterized by having an oval body, offset neck with a thick mouth, two vertical handles and a heavy stand. And there are two other rules there. So we define swirl rules um, that infer high-level tags from low-level um, low level tags. And the low-level tags are things like disc-shaped mouth, round body, broad handle, and they're attached by students in the UQ Antiquities um, Department. So it's both an e-learning tool as well as a um, annotation and tagging tool. So the test users take vast parts, we apply the inferencing rules, and then we do various evaluations. This just describes the laser scan we're using. Now there are smartphones that allow you to um, scan artifacts using a mobile phone. That shows the polygonal mesh type model that we generate. Um, the annotations are stored on a Sesame Open RDF um, server, and we're using the I. Euler Yap reasoning engine. So this is what the web portal looks like. This shows the actual annotation tool. So you can, I've actually got a video, but I don't have time to show it here today. But you can specify particular regions. This is the browsing annotations. You can attach textual documents, and here you can um, that, that provides the annotation details there. You can annotate single objects. You can annotate multiple objects and you can invoke semantic reasoning, and we also have an automatic measurement tool. So this shows in more detail, someone is annotating that handle um, as a black cylindrical handle. So we have a whole ontology of parts, object parts, and descriptors to stream up, um, speed line, speed up, streamline, speed up the annotation process. Um, and then this shows a simple, this is a simple one, entry logic rule, which says that um, if it has a particular height and the body of it has, is small and deep, it has one vertical handle, one horizontal handle, it has a wide mouth and it has a thin foot, it's a skiffos type B. And then you can give weightings. So in this case, the fact that it has one vertical handle, one horizontal handle, are very distinguishing attributes and you can weight those higher. And then you run that, once you've got a tagged object, you can run the reasoning engine and it gives you a ranked list of um, different vast types that's most likely to be. Um, and the same tool allows you to annotate relationships between parts of vases. And this is very helpful for that community because they need to be able to do comparative analyses. Given this tool, you can do advanced searches. Give me all the vases with the horizontal handle and white mouth. So search for objects based on parts. You can search for types of vases. You can search for associations. Give me all the vases of objects that are similar to this one. And then you can search for, you can define 3D regions and say, give me all the annotations that occur in this region. So spatial searching. So I'm going to conclude now. I just want to say all of these examples I've given, I think, are, I think it's significant. They're driven by a community. Both the community's problem and the community are responsible for a lot of the curation. The community comprises a group of users who need help to understand the data, and there's a lack of integrated, reliable information. We rely heavily on domain experts to refine the ontologies, to tag training courses, and to define the rules, and to help with the curation of the knowledge base. Um, the most important things here are we're combining institutional metadata, community-generated tags, with machine-generated metadata. Um, we're developing sets of curation services, annotation services, data quality, machine learning, statistical analysis and inferencing rules. 
We develop knowledge bases that are also training purposes. They combine case studies with compound learning objects. And by developing these knowledge bases, we're able to then support advanced searches, diagnoses, classification, decision support, and modeling. Where's the research going in this field? We're going to be needing more real-time curation and indexing tools. Real-time or near-real-time processing of data streams. Streaming RDF, streaming query languages. Continual learning over big data sets. Semantic markup, not just of static textual documents, but of models, reasoning over predictive models. Probabilistic inventory that will infer results but also give you a measure of certainty or reliability. And lastly, a project that I've been working on, how do you support citation of subsets of data when it's being dynamically generated by machines or by groups, community groups? Um, and I just need to acknowledge my team, and if you need to contact me, that's my email address and this website. Thank you.